Open your Bibles tonight to John 17. <clears throat> we continue our study following John Fables, John Flavel's sermons on the humiliation and exaltation of Christ, which has coincided so well with our catechism. We've looked at his incarnation, we've looked at his life, so according to the way the, our Savior's life is divided up, we come immediately now to the last and the lowest step of his humiliation, and that is death. And in, in essence, that's what's left. Coming into this world, living his life of righteousness, securing for us all of the blessings of the covenant, and then laying his life down. We come to that last step, his death on the cross. Flavel says it's out of the death of Christ that the life of our soul springs up. And it's in this blood of the cross that all our mercies swim to us. Christ's death purchases for us every single thing we enjoy. But at the same time, when you think of the death of Christ, it is like a deep well for the believer. It's full of inestimable blessings. And that's why Flavel spends so much time here. Not so much at the cross of Christ, but at everything surrounding this death, everything that leads up to it and is a part of it. As you well know, Jesus takes the Lord's, uh, takes his, the Last Supper with his disciples in John 13. He washes, he washes the disciples' feet. But we have from John uniquely this upper room discourse, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, going out to the garden in 18 where he is betrayed and arrested, and then the trial, and then, of course, the crucifixion in 19, and such forth. So John lays out for us a lot more detail in this, these last hours. So it serves us well to kind of pause here, and this is exactly what Flavel does. He'll trace several of these things for us in a series of sermons, and he comes to what he calls the preparations which lead up to the death. He'll have a series of sermons on the nature and quality of the death, of course, in Christ's death, we have the seven sayings of the cross. Those words are extremely important. You'll look at all of those. The funeral solemnities with which Christ was buried. And then, of course, he'll look at the blessed designs and glorious ends of his death. So that serves as the outline of what's ahead of us, all taking in literally the last hours of our Savior's life. Flavel finds six preparations leading up to Christ's death in Scripture. Three things done on the part of Christ for us. Three things done to Christ on the part of his enemies. Tonight we look at the first. This first act of preparation done by our Lord, which was what we find in John 17. The commending of his church to his father's care in the high priestly prayer of John 17. If you put together Christ's departing sermon... In John 14, 15, 16. And then his prayer of commendation in John 17. Flavel says in these chapters we see literally Christ setting his house in order before he lays down his life. And the beauty of John 17, as I think we all know, the beauty of John 17, the beauty of this prayer is that it gives us a window into Christ's intercession. It really sets forth the substance and the heart of what our high priest is doing. He who ever lives to make intercession. What does he do? How is he seeking? How is he securing for us the will of the Father? And this prayer shows us his heart for us. So let's read John 17. And let's be mindful that this is our Savior praying for us. Praying first for his disciples and then for all who will believe on him through the disciples' word. Continuing even down to you and to me today, in the church of all ages until he comes, here he prays for all of the elect, for all ages at once. And he encompasses and pulls in all our chief mercies. So the importance of this prayer can be seen in several ways. Verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, 
that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Amen. Flavel will spend just this one sermon on this prayer. From it, he'll draw four points. We'll look at those and really just a couple of applications. But the richness and the depth of this prayer, you can hear for yourself as we read through it. So much is in there. I told you before that the Puritan Anthony Burgess preached 148 sermons on this one chapter. The depth and the breadth of it. To think of all that Christ prays for. If this is the high priestly prayer, if this is the intercession of our Savior for His church, for all ages, for all their needs, then truly think of what's in here when we take our time and look at it and consider it. The sum of Christ's petitions is very simple. Of all that He prays, really the sum is in verse 11. Holy Father, keep them in Your name. He prays that his father would keep his people. The request for keeping, protecting, implies danger. There's two kinds of dangers that threaten the church. Two kinds of dangers that threaten you and me. First, there's the danger of our own sin. The sin of others, yes, but our own sin, our own backslidings. Secondly, there's the danger of ruin, persecution, destruction. We live in a world... It is in the power of the evil one, says John. An enemy prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. There's the danger of ruin. If Satan could, he would destroy the church and pull down that edifice that is built upon the stone of God. Of course, he cannot, but he will buffet it with all his might. And the means of preserving the church against both dangers are the same. The mighty power of God the mighty power of his Father. And Christ presses now his request with arguments drawn from three points. The sum of his prayer is, Father, keep them. He lays down three grounds, 
Three arguments, if you will. Three reasons why the Father should do this. First of all, his own condition. I am no longer in the world. Interesting. What's interesting about this prayer is he prays as if it's already done. This is before the cross. Christ here prays as if the cross is behind him. He says in the beginning, I have glorified your name. Or rather, I have, I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. The central part of his work is yet ahead. Drinking of the cup of the wrath of God. And yet he prays as if it's finished, because it is so finished. It's as good as done because he is so resolved to do it. As we find so clearly in John 18, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has put in my hand? And we know how the story unfolds. So he prays in the past tense. I've done it. I've finished it. I've kept them. I'm coming to you. I'm no longer in the world, he says. He's already looking ahead again, which is why this gives us such a window into his intercessions as high priest. The high priest that has been resurrected and is now entered into the Holy of Holies, the anchor within the veil. That's how he's praying. He's not praying as if there is still a possibility that this may not work out, that he may not be able to finish the race. He's praying upon the ground of having finished everything. So the first ground and argument drawn is that his his own condition, I'm no longer in the world. Second, our condition, we're still in the world. He gets to leave, but we must stay. We're still here. Thirdly, the joint interest he and his father have in his people. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. They were yours first. You've committed them to me to keep them for you. Now will you keep them for me? The son was sent into the world to keep the father's people. The son left the world praying that the father would keep his people. It's the same people. It's the same elect. So these are the three things laid down. So the doctrine that is drawn out of the text by Flavel is this. We see Christ's fatherly care and tender love imminently manifested in the pleading prayer he poured out for his people at his departing from them. So we're we're pointed to the heart of Christ, the care and the love of Christ for us in that he prays for us in this prayer, especially at a time when all we would be thinking about is our demise. All we would be thinking about is any moment Judas is coming. Any moment the soldiers are coming. Christ knew all this. Christ knew what was going to happen. He went into the garden to meet Judas. He went into the garden there because that's where he would be taken. He knows very well. But when Christ's mind, as it were, should be taken up with all that he is about to do, he prays for us instead. In fact, it's because of what he was about to do that he prays for us. And that's what we'll see as we go forth. So four things. First of all, let's look at the mercies that Christ requested for us. Christ asks for no trifles. He doesn't ask for small things. He asks for the the very best things that his redeeming work affords us. Five things he lists here. First of all, we'll, we'll be right around verses 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. That's really where we'll stay. First of all, he prays for our preservation from sin and danger. Look at verse 11. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. Verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So there it is twice. Keep them, keep them. Keep them in your name, keep them from the evil one. He prays for our preservation from sin and danger. And dear church, this, this is why we are, pers- we are preserved amid a world of temptations. This is why we're not ruined and destroyed amid multitudes of malicious enemies who are set on fire by hell against the church of God on earth. The sin that's in our own hearts, the malice that's in the heart of the church's enemies, all of these would quickly ruin our souls and bodies if it weren't for God's keeping hand every moment. Why have we not apostatized from the faith? Why have we not thrown in the towel? Why have we not in the face of persecution and suffering and the cost to follow Christ, why have we not just given up and gone back? This prayer. Christ prayed for the church's preservation. How was it, as we said this morning, how was it that so many martyrs in the church's history were able to go to the stakes and be burned alive, eaten by lions, cut and tortured and pulled by ropes by horses? How could the church go through these things? How could our brothers, as frail and as weak as we are, Thoughts terrifying us if we think that what it would be like for us to go through those things. 
I can't imagine what it would be like to be burned alive. How can God's people, how can frail, weak sheep endure such pain and suffering and not abandon the cross and give up on Christ? This is not what I signed up for. This is not what, what is it that preserves the church? The point is, it's this prayer. This prayer, the heart of Christ, it's Christ priestly intercession. This is Hebrews 7.25 all night long. He is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to the Father by him. Why? Because he ever lives to make intercession for him. It's his intercession that preserves. It's his intercession that keeps. We have no reason to boast. We have no ground to claim any strengthening of ourselves. The only reason we're still here and haven't thrown in the towel is because Christ prays for us. The only reason Satan hasn't completely turned our lives upside down and ruined us and dispatched with us is because Christ prays for us. He did it here to show us this is what he has always been doing. He's been praying for the church. Remember this morning he was always the prophet. He was the prophet in his incarnation. He's the prophet forever. It's the same we're going to find with the priest. He was always the priest. He was the Old Testament high priest behind Aaron. Toward whom Aaron pointed. It was Christ. He's always been doing the priestly work. It's his blood that stood for atonement, though not yet shed, but shed in the heart and the mind of God as the, as the purchase price. It's his intercession that kept the church safe. All the years of the Old Testament, all the years now of the New Testament era, and it's the only reason you're still here following Christ today. Isaiah 43, though you pass through the water, though you pass through the fire, the flood shall not overwhelm you, the fire shall not burn you. Why? Because I am with you. It's as much as to say in this context, because I'm praying for you. We'll find, we'll come back and we'll end, in fact, on Luke 22, 32. What did Jesus say to Peter? What kept Peter from not being another Judas? There's really very little. There's a heart, the difference is at the heart of the matter, praise God, but there's very little difference on the outside between what Judas did and what Peter did. In fact, all the disciples left him. What was the difference between Judas and Peter? Only of Peter did Jesus say, I have prayed for you. He was always praying for Peter. It's not just that I, he prayed for him here. He was always praying for Peter. He has been praying for Peter since he has been an intercessor. Just as he's been praying for us. This is why we're still here, beloved. He prays for your preservation from sin and danger. Otherwise, our sin would ruin us. Our hearts are so sinful. We are so full of fallenness still. The remnants of sin are still so strong. Think of how they do. Think of how we do fall so terribly if the Lord were to just lift his hand for a moment. Look how Peter fell. Look how David fell. Look how Moses fell. Look how Abraham fell. Look how all the saints fell. If the Lord would just back up for a second. He prays for our preservation. Secondly, he prays for union. Verse 11. He prays that we may be one. What's interesting about this prayer of unity is it's not only a great mercy to be united as a church, and not just as this church, but the church of God on earth, to enjoy the unity of the faith, right? There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, says Paul in Ephesians 4. One God and Father over all, one Christ and Savior of the church. The unity that we enjoy is not only a great mercy, but it's also a special means of accomplishing our preservation. Being united. United, we're strong. Standing together, we stand in a might. We stand with strength. This is all secured by the blessing of God. The church in its unity has been able to accomplish much. And we in our unity are able to accomplish much. We are able to, we are able to stand. Think of the unity established when we pray together for the Lord's mercies. When we pray as a congregation. When an email goes out and we have a prayer request for someone. Think of the might of the prayer of the united church. We storm the gates of heaven because we're united. It's a great means of our preservation. It's not just a mercy, not just a kindness or a blessing. It's key. Unity is important. Division, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Division rips and tears and destroys. Christ prayed. Division would be none, but there would be unity. Thirdly, verse 13, what does he pray for? Now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. What's interesting here is Christ doesn't, doesn't just pray that we might be joyful. Notice he prays that we might have his joy. Think of the joy of Christ. For the joy set before him, 
he endured the cross, despising the shame. That's some joy. That is some joy to, to go through the cross, to suffer the cross, to lay down his life. That was some joy. And he prays that his joy might be fulfilled in us. Christ's desire to provide for our full joy, even when his greatest sorrow was at hand. This is not a time for joy for Christ. He's about to suffer in ways that we can't even imagine. What does he pray for, though? His joy might be fulfilled in us. What a glorious prayer. Christ prays for your joy. He comes to secure it, and he prays to give it. Number four, he prays that we might be sanctified through the word. Here we come down to verse 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Christ would have his word plant gracious habits and principles deeply in our hearts for our sanctification. And again, this holiness is not only a mercy in itself, but it's also, again, a great means toward accomplishing our preservation, our unity, and our joy. Holiness. Following Christ closely. Christ would have us not just believe upon him, but he would have us enjoy his life of holiness. He would have us sanctified. Again, not just set apart holy unto God, but sanctified, cleansed, washed, purged by the living and the abiding word as we've seen in Peter. He would have that word sanctify us, make us holy, not just initially, but in our daily conduct, which is the whole substance of 1 Peter. Our conduct, our way of life, our walk, and then fifthly, this is the fifth mercy Christ, pray, Christ prays for, that we might be with him and behold his glory. This takes us to verse 24, actually. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. This is the best and the ultimate privilege. Think about this for a moment. The purpose, the end, the chief end, if you will, the end of Christ coming down from heaven and returning again runs into this, Hebrews 2.10, that he might bring many sons to glory. This is why Christ came down, to bring sons to glory. He came to get his church and to take them with him. We couldn't go immediately. What did he say to his disciples in John 14? You can't follow me now. John 13, 14 there, right? Where I'm going, you cannot come, but you will come later. You know the way. Lord, how do we know the way? I am the way. He will come and take his people home. One day he will return. He's having, having dealt with sin, he will come and bring a full and a final salvation for his church. And what is his goal? To bring us back with him. And beloved, when he comes to take us home, all this is over. No more pain, no more sorrow. Open your Bibles again to Revelation and read for yourselves. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more death. Everything is... This is Christ's end goal. I want them with me. I want them to see my glory. And to see the love that you gave to me before the foundation of the world. That eternal love. Christ wants us to enjoy that. Are these small things that Christ prays for? These are big things. If you really take it all in, Christ prays for our salvation. Very clear in verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Christ prays for the salvation of the church. He prays for the sanctification of the church. And then he prays for the glorification of the church. Christ here prays for absolutely everything you need. From A to Z, Alpha to Omega, he leaves nothing out. It's all here. All your chief and choicest mercies are secured by his priestly intercession. This is a sample of his priestly work. This opens the heart, pulls, this pulls back the veil so that you can see what is the consequence of having such a high priest as Jesus Christ. He secures all these for you. This is how he prays for you. This is his intercessory work. And this is why we enjoy all that we enjoy, because we have such a priest who prays for our blessings. So these are the mercies he requested for us. Now he lays down, Flavel says, the arguments. He pleads these arguments with his father for these things. On what grounds does he ask for these things to be given? First of all, that common interest that he and his father have in the people for whom he prays. Look at verse 10. 
All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Look back at verse 6. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. These are the ones that that belong to the Father. Everybody takes care of his own. right? Everyone takes care of his own. And here here Christ prays, these for whom I pray, they are yours. Here we see the unity in the Trinity. Those entrusted to the Savior to redeem are the one he the ones he redeems. The church given to him is the church for whom he lays down his life because he doesn't lay down his life for any of those for whom he does not also pray that they might enjoy the benefits of that laying down. It all goes together. There's complete harmony in the Trinity and harmony in the work itself so that as the Father here lays out to the Son a people, Christ receives the people, secures blessing for these people. These are the people for whom he intercedes behind the veil. He prays For the church, the Father set his eternal love on the elect. And in that love, he gave them to Christ. Ephesians 1, we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. If we're chosen in Christ, then we're chosen by someone other than Christ. We're chosen by the Father in his Son. Because the Son is chosen as the mediator. And the church is chosen to be given to the Son that he might mediate for them and secure for them reconciliation and fellowship with the Father. These are the Father's own. Surely he will keep, comfort, and sanctify them. How can the Father not give these mercies to those who belong to him? There's another thing in verse 10, and that is Christ's honor. I am glorified in them. This is what's so amazing. Christ has bound up. Christ's glory is bound up with his church. We always close our service with a benediction. It's God's blessing to you. This morning I made a note and said, and we're not going to close with a benediction. We're going to close with a doxology, which is our looking up and blessing God. Praise to him. Why did I use that as a benediction? Simply because his glory, when he gets his glory, you get your good. Because God has bound his glory with you. That's what's so amazing. The Son can't be glorified without the church also being glorified. The Son can't be glorified without the church getting all these things. This is how His high priestly intercession can't fail. Because He has bound His glory up with it. Because He has been appointed, as we saw this morning, the mediator, the high priest. So His work is bound up, and the efficacy of His work is bound up with His glory and honor. Christ's glory is tied to his people. If we perish, what will become of our Redeemer? If the church perishes, what will become of Christ? If the church perishes, it's Christ's fault. If the wicked perish, it's their own fault. But in the covenant, God takes full responsibility for his church. Remember Genesis 15? Who passes between the pieces? God and not Abraham. God takes on both sides of the covenant. I will do my part and I will do your part. In fact, I will send my son to do your part. So Christ, God takes full responsibility for the elect. He comes to redeem. He comes down. He comes to save. In fact, he comes to be your everything. Your all in all. Christ doesn't leave any part of redemption any box of redemption unchecked for you to check and finish the deal, seal the deal. He says, I will do it all. I am a whole savior and I bring a whole salvation. So if the church perishes, it's Christ's fault because Christ was set apart by the father to save the church. The church can't perish. Why can't the church perish? Because Christ added the church to himself. He united the church to himself. The Spirit unites the church to Christ. That stone, we are built upon the the stone of God as these living stones were united together. We can't be separated from Him. Again, 17, 1 to 4. You have given me, the Son that is, you have given me authority to give eternal life to all whom you have given me. And I have glorified you. I have accomplished your work. Now glorify me. You gave me the authority to give eternal life to the elect. 
I've done it. Again, past tense. I've done it. Now glorify me. And you can't glorify the Son without glorifying the church too. Christ and his church are one, right? Are one, united as one. Christ is the head of the church. You can't raise the head without raising the body with it. All right, you getting the picture? That's what's so important. So Christ's honor is bound up with the church's care. So this is a ground he lays out. Father, I am glorified in them. My glory is tied to them. Keep them. Of course they'll be kept. So is God's love for his son. Of course they'll be kept. Thirdly, Christ's departure. Verse 11, I'm no longer in the world. Christ is physically leaving his people. He will pour out his spirit upon the church. We read this morning, Acts 2.33. But he is physically leaving his people. He has traveled with his disciples all these years. He has taken care of them, met their needs, counseled them, encouraged them, forgiven them, rebuked them, comforted them. He has been everything to them. Now he's leaving. It's going to cause them tremendous sadness and trouble. What will become of them when he's gone? He asked the Father to look after them. And that will entail, of course, pouring out another one like me, a paraclete, a comforter. One like me will come. The Father will send him. I will send him. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, says the Creed. And he'll be poured out on the church, the very Spirit of Christ. Christ is leaving. They need keeping. He prays for that. Fourthly, their danger. Verse 11, they are still in the world. The world is a sinful and infecting place. It lies in wickedness. It lies in the power of the evil one, says 1 John 5. It is a hard thing for poor, weak, and imperfect people to escape the world's pollutions. You can't get this world, get through this world without, a, without being infected by it in some way or another. And even if we could, we definitely can't escape the world's troubles and persecutions and oppositions. Because just as he was not of the world, so we are not of the world. Just as they hated him, they will hate us. Just as they persecuted him, they will persecute us. I'm leaving, but they're still here, he says. We are like soldiers in an enemy's camp. We are sheep among wolves. We are treasure among thieves. Since Christ must leave, and he must. He has to leave. We know this. In fact, it is better for us that he go away, he says. He has to leave because he has to lay down his life. He has to finish... <coughs> And complete every aspect of redemption. He has to atone. He has to be raised. He has to ascend. He has to sit. Testifying to the finished work. And then pray. Intercede. Which is what he's doing. He asked the Father to take special care of us. Fifthly then his ascension. The purpose of his coming to the Father is to intercede. I am no longer in the world. But they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Why is he coming? He is coming to intercede. He is ascending as their advocate. He is ascending as their intercessor. In other words, his, his priestly work involves two aspects. You know this from the Old Testament. The high priest was to, a, was to offer a sacrifice, and with that atoning blood, he was to go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the mercy seat and intercede. He couldn't do one without the other. Both were necessary because it was only after the intercession that he would then come out and say, the Lord bless you and keep you. Right? It's finished. Atonement has been made. So the priestly work involves two things. He must lay down a sacrifice. In this case, Christ lays down himself as the sacrifice. But he must also intercede. So I must come. I have to go. I must go beyond the veil. I must enter, enter into the temple not made with hands. The temple of God in the heavens before the Lord himself and pray for the sheep. So this is not an option. And now he gives them a taste of his intercession here in this chapter. The importance of this is, as the Father answers this request, then it brings tremendous encouragement to the efficacy of Christ's request in heaven. Imagine if any part of this request were denied. Notice that Christ prays this in the hearing of the disciples. He prays this that they may hear it. This is very important. He prays in the hearing of his church. He prays audibly. Praying to the Father, but I speak these things I speak in the world, he says. That is, before them. He wants them to hear it. What if any part, even the smallest part of this prayer, went unanswered? What hope would the church have for his request 
above. Christ prays, everything is given, that the church might know that Christ is an effective intercessor who prays according to the heart of the Father and everything that he requests is given. He cannot be denied. And these are the grounds upon which he cannot be denied. They are yours. My glory is bound up in them. My honor is bound up in them. I'm leaving. They're still here. They're in danger. I'm coming to you to finish the priestly work that you've called me to do for them. And now, of course, Christ's faithfulness. Verse 12. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction. In other words, as he said earlier in verse 4, I have accomplished the work you gave me to do. I have finished it all. You gave me sheep. I've not lost a single one except Judas, the son of destruction, because Judas was not given as a sheep. Judas was set among the sheep as a wolf, as a betrayer, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled. He has lost none. His faithfulness is laid out as a ground that the Father would do his part, that he would be the keeper. And isn't this what Peter says? We are kept through faith by the power of God for a salvation to be revealed in the last time, 1 Peter chapter 1. Isn't that beautiful? Peter was here. He heard this prayer. Christ prays for the church's keeping. And Peter tells us to rejoice because the church is being kept. By whom? By God. How? Through faith. Just as Christ prayed, so it is done. The reasons that Christ prays for these things are three. Did Christ pray? Did he storm the gates of heaven because the Father was unwilling to grant these things? Of course not. He knows the heart of the Father because the heart of the Father and the Son are one. In fact, it is the Father that sends the Son. So the Father always prays according to the heart of the, heart of the Father. The Son always prays according to the heart of the Father, and therefore his requests are always secured. But why did he pray this way? First of all, because he knew the trial that was ahead. The disciples had no idea. He had told them. He had given three predictions in the Gospels of what was coming. Of his coming death and betrayal, being handed over. They still didn't understand the fullness of what he was saying. How could they? He was the Messiah, the Son of God, says Peter. The Christ. But Christ knew what was ahead. He knew how the coming hour would sift his people. Luke 22, he says it to Peter. Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. Now he speaks to Peter. Peter was in many ways a representative, as you know, of the disciples. But, but Satan would not just sift Peter. He would sift the whole disciple band. He would sift the whole church. Satan desired to sift them as wheat. So he prayed. He prayed against that. Secondly, he knew the power of darkness closing in upon them. This is the hour and the power of darkness, says Christ. I don't know that that, script, or that phrase is mentioned anywhere else in Scripture, certainly nowhere else in the Gospel. The power of darkness. You can imagine the power with which Satan came against our Lord, thinking that he had at last secured his goal, having missed him when he was an infant, though he tried to kill him, having missed him in the wilderness when he tried to lead him into sin, having missed him in so many places, in so many ways, now he comes. And he comes on full force. He comes with might. He brings all he has with all his guns, an entire battery. This is the power of darkness. This is no ordinary trial coming upon the church. Just as it's no ordinary trial coming upon our Lord. Satan left our Lord in the wilderness waiting for a more opportune time. If there ever was an opportunity, it's now because he's going to lay himself down. He's going to surrender. He's going to be led like a sheep to the slaughter. He's not going to revile. He's not going to say anything in return. He's going to let them speak ill of him. He's going to lay himself down and give himself up. This is certainly an opportunity. And Satan comes with might. And therefore our Lord knew that their faith would be greatly shaken to see him crucified. Do you remember Luke 24, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus? Oh, he was the one. Surely he was the one. We thought he was the one. But alas... This is the third day since he's died. Their faith was greatly shaken. They had really hoped. Whatever their vision was of what this man would do, this rabbi, this Messiah, whatever their vision was of what he would do to, re to restore things to Israel, to deliver from the Romans, whatever their vision, however earthly it may have been, their hopes were on this man. But alas, it's the third day. This was a great trial. Their faith was greatly shaken. Christ foresaw the great difficulties that they would face, says Flavel, between a busy devil and a bad heart. 
their own sinfulness, their own fear. They all forsook him in the garden. Peter denied him in the court. So Christ prays. This is why he prays as he does. And the beauty of this, beloved, I would just bring this home to your heart right now. Christ knows your current trials. Think of how particularly Christ prays every single day. You don't know what you're going to face tomorrow. You don't know what you're going to face next year. You have no idea what the next week, the next month, the next year will bring. You don't know. But he does. Christ knew these things were ahead of his people. He prayed ahead of time. He prayed. Though Satan would sift the church, he prays that their faith may not fail. That's what he prayed for. And he says, when you are restored, he says to Peter, strengthen your brother. How do you know he'd be restored? Because he prayed for his restoration. He prayed for his keeping. He prayed for, for his preservation. He knew he wasn't going to fall. That is ultimately and utterly. And therefore, he would be able to arise again and strengthen his brethren, which is exactly what we're finding in 1 Peter. Take this to heart. The Lord knows what you're going through today. He knows what you'll face tomorrow. He knows what you'll face at the end of your life. He prays for you, particularly. You have no idea, but he does. Doesn't that give us a tremendous measure of comfort and also boldness to enter into every affliction, every trial, every suffering, every heartache, no matter what it is, Take this to heart. Don't miss this. <clears throat> Whatever you go through, Christ has already prayed for you to be kept and sanctified and strengthened and brought to the other side. Remember when he told the disciples, let's get in the boat to the other side? They thought they were going to die on the, on the sea. They had no idea what awaited them, but he did. But notice what he said. We're going to the other side. And I know what's between this side and that side, though you do not. And I promise you, we're going to the other side. Christ prays for you to get through these things, to come to the other side, and to be the better for them. Don't miss that comfort. Flavel doesn't take us there, but I want you to see that. Secondly, what's the other reason he prays for these things? Christ wanted to give us an example of his inter intercessory work in heaven. John 14, 16. He says, I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Christ here says, I will pray to the Father. I will petition the Father. I will plead for you. I will advocate for you. What does that look like? What does it entail? Christ here gives us a window into his intercessory work. And more importantly, Christ wanted to show us what affections and what dispositions or in his heart, toward his church, when he laid down his life, and then when he goes home. You remember the heart of Christ that we studied with Goodwin, the great concern that Goodwin addresses, looking at John 13, verse 1, the great concern that Goodwin addresses in that treatise, or the great question is, now that the, that the Son has finished his work of humiliation, and he's been exalted by the Father, he's been crowned, he has his, his, new, his new body that's immortal, and He's ascended in the heavens and all the angels and the host of heavens bow and worship him and all the glories that he now has in heaven. How is the heart of Christ toward his poor little church on earth now? The heart of Christ in heaven towards sinners on earth. That's the treatise you remember. And Goodwin asked that question. Because what does the church, what is the church tempted? What is the church tempted to think? He doesn't even think about me anymore. He's in glory, the angels, the saints already there. Does Christ even think on me? Does Christ even look on me? Is he even, is he even looking down right now into my life and see what I'm going through? Does he have any idea how much pain I'm in, how much suffering, how hard this is, how distressed, how grieved, how sorrowed, how tempted, how hard? Does Christ ever think of me, little old me? That's the question that Goodwin asks and answers. He gathers from John 17, John 13, and he reminds us very clearly, Christ is even more affectionate toward his church. And think of this prayer now. Has Christ forgotten you? Absolutely not. No one is more eager for him to leave heaven to come to get you than he is. Why? Because his honor and his glory is bound up with you. How can he forget you? 
when the glory that he is to receive is the glory of mediator, head, redeemer, stone. It's all tied to you. It's impossible for Christ to ascend to a place and to receive such blessings and glory that he forgets the church for which he died. He will not, if you will, will not be happy until his glory is complete, and it will not be complete until you're brought safely home. This is why Goodwin so famously said, Christ will not rest until his church is home. He will not lack a finger. He will come to the earth for but a finger, even that much of his body, even just you. And he will come and take you home. His heart is toward you, and that's what this text does. It gives us a window into his heart, and it's a beautiful picture. Goodwin draws on John 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. When Christ knew everything, though he was about to endure, everything that he would need to endure, and he knew he would, he knew he would return to the Father afterwards, yet he loved us to the end which means completely, eternally, fully, he can never forget us. What a beautiful window into his heart this prayer is. Remember Isaiah 49, verses 14 to 18, right? Has the Lord forgotten me? Has the Lord forgotten Israel? A mother may forget her nursing child, but the Lord could never forget you. He has engraven you and your names upon the palms of his hands. How could he forget you? That's the picture. There's no way. What a wonderful window into his love for you. Thirdly, the third reason Christ prays for these things, he wanted to leave this prayer as a standing monument of his fatherlike care and love for his people to the end of the world. Verse 13. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that is, I speak in their hearing. I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. We have no reason... To, to despair, no reason to be despondent, no reason to worry or be anxious. If this is how Christ is interceding for us, if this is what our high priest is doing, then all is well. All is well today, all will be well tomorrow, all will be well to the end of our days and for all eternity. Because he asked for the very things I need. And they cannot fail to be answered. He finishes up his considerations by pointing out two quick evidences. His doctrine was we see, we see Christ's love, Christ's fatherly love for us. He says there's two evidences of Christ's love for his church, Christ's love for you in this prayer. The first is the excellent mercies he chose for us. Christ doesn't pray for your health, your honor among men. He doesn't pray for your riches. He doesn't pray for temporal comforts. What does Christ pray for? Preservation from sin, joy in God, unity, sanctification, preservation from the evil one, and eternal glory. What a wise father. What a loving father. Let the fathers of earth lay out for their kids trinkets as treasures. Here is the fatherly love of our Savior who secures for his people, his church, his children, his bride, the best choicest treasures what we really need to get through life indeed to get through life and to enter into eternal glory with him forever all other things don't really matter this is what we need and this is what christ prays for what a heart secondly he's affectionately pleading our concerns with god when a world of sorrow encompassed him and a cup of wrath was about to be delivered into his hand all his cares should have been about himself and all he can think of is us. And indeed, it's because he was about to secure these things that he prayed. So we see the unity of Christ's concern and care for his church, and then his whole willingness to lay down his life and secure it by purchase, by the price required, the atonement, his own life. He can pray for these things, and he prays past tense, because so sure is his laying down his life. So sure is he. And so resolved is he to go through to the bitter end. And so he prays as if it's already done. 
but it wasn't yet done, was it? For him to pray this prayer at a time when he should be so taken up with himself as we would be in our weakness, but for him to pray this prayer knowing what he was about to endure, John 13, 1, and yet loving us so deeply to pray like this for us at this time, this truly evidences his heart. We have no reason to ever doubt how much we mean to the Father and the Son and the Spirit, the triune God in one. Flavel gives us really just two simple inferences. There were a couple of other things in his own treatise, but Yule brings out just these two, and I think these two are the ones that we need to look at. And the first one is obvious. The perseverance of the saints is unquestionable. How could the Father ever deny the Son? Keep them. Keep them. I pray for them, for they are yours. My honor is bound, is bound up with them. My glory is bound. How can I be glorified as their Redeemer if they're not redeemed? If I lay down my life for them, and it's not enough to bring them home, then what does that say about this plan of ours? The preservation of the church, the saints, the elect, is unquestionable. And moreover, as we've said already, the son's will and heart for the elect are the same as the father's. So the answer is doubly secured. Flavel puts it this way. Every word in this prayer is a chosen arrow drawn by a strong and skillful hand. We do not need to question if it hits the mark. It's bullseye. He cannot fail to be answered. When dangers surround us, when fears and doubts multiply within, we should think of Christ's words to Peter. Luke twenty two thirty two, I have prayed for you. That's it. Is there anything better? Is there anything more that we need? It's a comfort when we say to one another, I'm praying for you, brother. I'm praying for you, sister. Thank you so much. That comforts me when people say that to me. I really appreciate that. <laughs> but what if Christ says it to you? What is it when Christ says it to you? And that's what John 17 says. This is him saying to you what he said to Peter. I have prayed for you, my church. I have prayed for you. Don't fear. Don't doubt. Don't worry. Hold on. As we said this morning, hold on. Press on. Keep the faith. Be strong. You're on a stone that cannot be moved. I have prayed for you. Secondly, of course, this is the point of his doc, the Flavel's doctrine in this text, the doctrine he draws out of the text. Christ has great love for his people. What a heart. Christ would not leave this world until he secured your blessings. And we don't find this, of course, in any of the other, any of the other gospels. It's John that lays this out for John the Beloved. John, the one who leaned on Christ's bosom. John gives us a particular window. What's interesting when you compare the last hours of Christ's life to the other Gospels, all three Gospels, all other, the three synoptic Gospels, they all look at what's happening to Christ. They all look at the circumstances surrounding his suffering, his last hours, what's being done to him. Only John looks at his disposition in the midst of it all. And that, what, that's, what, that's where we get John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. The beauty of 18 is wonderful. I love 18. You don't get that in any of the other Gospels. John takes this wonderful look. And remember, John writes this Gospel much later. But by the grace of God and inspired by the Spirit of God, we need this. We need to see Christ's heart. It's one thing, if all this is happening to him, he, he appears passive in so many ways. And indeed he is, like a lamb led to the slaughter. He opens not his mouth. He appears passive. It is his, in one sense, his passive obedience. But John reminds us he's very active in that passivity. He's actively engaged for you, praying for you, loving you, serving you, interceding for you, actively laying out his life for you. No one takes my life from me, he said. I lay it down on my own. I have the authority to do it and have the authority to take it up again. I received this from my father, John 10. What a glorious thing, how active he is and how much he loves you. And this is, this is what we see. He would not leave the world until his house was set in order, until you were safe. Remember, he laid down his life on his own. He died 
when he was ready. He was betrayed when he was finished with his work. He was arrested when he had finished caring for his church. He was not taken. He gave himself. He wouldn't lay down his life until, until he had laid his hands on these blessings for us by prayer. The dying prayer of anybody is pretty amazing. Here is his dying prayer. The last words of anyone are very important. His dying prayer for his church is that we would have all of these mercies. And what I appreciate is to think about it this way. Between Hebrews 10.5, which we've been looking at in the catechism, Behold, I come to do your will, O God. Right? The eternal Son of God coming into the womb of the Virgin to take up the body you have prepared for me. Behold, I come. At the first of his life, to the end of his life. You're on his mind. He's thinking of you. He's coming for you. We were the first and last on his heart. He came in the first step of his condescension and humiliation for you. Up to the very last step, John 13, 1. Unto the end he has loved you. He's never altered his course or his purpose or his heart. How secure we are. Takes us full circle to this morning's message. How precious you are to him, dear church. You're precious because he's precious. And it's by the pleasure of the Father and the delight and joy of the Son to love you, to join you to himself, to take you into fellowship with himself. He has a heart to give you himself. And that's what he's done. That's the good news. That's the gospel. What an encouragement and what a comfort. So many things can distract us. So many things can worry us. So many things can take us off of our course and set fear alive in our hearts. But when we allow those things to take hold, we're forgetful. We are forgetful. What we need to remember is our Savior's heart. And that is what is so clear through the Gospels and all of his compassion and tenderness. And especially in these closing chapters, these last few hours that John gives us a window into by his gospel. So read this. Read it for yourself. Go back and begin in John 13 and read these chapters together. And think of it and look at it from that perspective. What is Christ thinking, feeling, doing for you in the context of all that's going on around him and all that's happening to him that the other gospels talk so clearly about? And you'll see the heart. As Flavel says in his doctrine here, Christ's fatherly care and tender love is imminently manifested for you. He loves you. He loves you, beloved. Amen. Any thoughts or comments or questions as we think about this? Chris. singing this month the older we grow with Jesus mm. and we really I, I never yeah. really thought about it until yeah. the past dinner. You know, older we keep loving Jesus, vast unmeasured, yeah. boundless free, rolling as a mighty mm. ocean in its fullness over me, underneath me, all around me, mm. is a current of thy love, leading onward, leading homeward into thy glorious rest of mm. Right. So I would just encourage everyone to mm. just think in this praise God that that's mm. what's happening. Yeah, amen. Yeah, his heart is on display for us. John.
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 The strength for that is not in us, right? Not just to lay down your life, but to do it with praise and glory and thanks to God. That's all the fruit of Christ's prayer. Our preservation, uh, but our love for Him, right? He He causes our love to endure, right? That's just yeah. The church is safe. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church because he's the stone upon which it's built and he builds it. His spirit fills it. He has cast out the strong man and he has filled the church with his own spirit. Poured out the spirit upon the church. We are safe. It's, I mean, that's the beauty of you know, the type and the foreshadowing of Noah's Ark. What a massive, wrathful flood. Covers everything. And yet the church was safe in that ark. That's the picture but a picture of the much greater reality of how safe we are in Christ. So we have Paul's in him, in him, in him, in him. We're in the ark. We're in the ark of Christ. Amen. Julie. Julie. Yeah. Yeah, right. So it says in the past, I will do all this, and then the next time, yep. and I will do all this, and, and all of the brethren are so powerful and so confident. So you have all the parts, and it's yeah. all how to walk with God and the power of God and how strong it is. So we're all doing it, and that's why I said to you, we need to go to work all of you in the house where it's keeping you and doing it at night and putting you up Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's glorious, right? Christ, we don't see in that passage uh, that we're going to miss those things. In fact, when you go through those, right? We're going to go through them. And that takes us right here to verse 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. He could have, right? In one sense, that would have been the easiest thing. And we might say, why didn't you pray for us to skip all this? Right? It would have been a lot easier. But this is how we're sanctified, right? You never know the power of God so beautifully as you see it in the face of the storm, right? It was only then that they learned to say, and we're compelled to say, who then is this man? The might and the power of Christ and all the miracles he had done, that was nothing. Who is this man? In the face of our troubles and trials, we then begin to see the strength of God to, to preserve us in the midst of some devastating things, but also to, you know, to be with us and to walk through those things with us. So we're not... There's no prayer that we'd be taken out of these things. There's a prayer that would be kept in those things because it's by these things that the church is made better. This is how our dross is removed. This is how our idolatries are laid down as we prayed this morning. This is how we're made like Christ. And as we said before, when we think about all our troubles and trials, let's remember that the Father isn't treating us any differently than he treated his Son. Right? The cross came before the crown for Christ. It cannot but be that way for the church. Paul says, we will share in his glories when we've shared in his sufferings, right? And we're sure we're going to share in his glories because we've shared in his sufferings. There's, these are inseparable. As they were inseparable for Christ, the head of the church, the leader, the captain of our salvation, they're inseparable for us. Now, on his part, they're atoning, right? They're, they're satisfying measures. On our part, they're not atoning. They're sanctifying measures. So it's different for us, and praise God it is. Otherwise, what is it for the wicked? Atoning and satisfying, although it, they can never atone or satisfy, which is why all it does is add to their misery. But for us, if we'll listen, if we'll 
yield to it, right? If we'll give to it, in Hebrews 12, it'll yield the, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. We will grow by it. We will learn by it. We'll be better by it. We'll be sanctified by it. It will make us more like Jesus. And that's what we need to keep our eye on when we go through sufferings and trials. How is this conforming me to Christ? Even if I don't know, this much I know. My, the Father is seeking to conform me to his Son. That's what this is about. So what in me, that's not Christ-like, needs to go? And what is there more about him that I need to take on, put on, take on Christ that I need to walk in? So this helps us. Misty. Absolutely, yeah, and we can forget that. How easily do we give in to fear? Yeah. And the Lord has Lord has, has done much in his word, and certainly all of Christ has accomplished, but how much of his word speaks to this, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Isaiah 43, I am with you. What's worse than floods and flames? But I'm with you. You're not going to be overwhelmed. You're going to get through this. It's going to be okay. Right? Good. All right, well, let's... Uh, close with Psalm 22a. We're going to sing verses 8 to 11. Why don't we start with verse 1 so we can be reminded of these notes. This is a familiar tune. We've sung this many times. We'll start with verse 1 and then we'll do 8 to 11. I've chosen this because Psalm 22, of course, is preeminent in the sufferings of Christ. But here at the end of the psalm, you see really the prayer, if you will, of Christ upon his victory upon the consequence of his suffering, the glories and the blessings that come to the church. because So we might say we come to verse 8 and we might hear our Savior say, I have finished the work you gave me to do. Right? And now we come into these closing verses. So let's